Morning, Norm. That's about the only one I heard. Good morning. Hopefully everyone's enjoying the sunshine this morning. Uh, my name is Jamie. I'm here on staff uh, at Freshwater. And if this is your first time here, either online or in person, if you could text the word welcome to 330-281-4833, that'd be great. It gives us a chance to get to know you a little bit and for you to get to know us as well. So uh, I'm going to run, th run through some quick announcements here. The first one is called Freshwater Basics. That is two Sundays from now, uh, April 28th from 2 to 4.30. Uh, that is an opportunity to come hear the history of our church and also our denomination, the Christian and Missionary Alliance. This is a free class. It is required for membership, but you do not have to become a member afterwards uh, if you would like to take that. So you can scan the QR code to register online, or you can also go on our website or our app to find all of our events. Um, next up is our church-wide spring workday on Saturday, May 4th. Uh, starting at 9 a.m. Uh, we're looking for at least 30 people to come get our church grounds. That includes the church and the office over here. Um, get that ready for spring. Uh, there will be donuts in the morning and coffee in the morning, and then stick around afterwards to grab some lunch. Andrew Canan's face just lit up when I mentioned lunch. So uh, you can find a list of tasks with the registration link uh, by scanning that QR code. Uh, you can also, there will be someone at the Next Steps table in the foyer uh, who can tell you more about what that morning is going to look like and get you signed up for that if you'd like um, to do that as well. Sorry, my phone asked me if I want to send feedback. No, I don't want to send feedback. Um, and finally, uh, we have a list of events up on the screen. Um, as usual, there is a lot going on, too, that I wanted to point out. Um, uh, deadline today to sign up for our Senior Saints Progressive Dinner, if you'd still like to do that. And then Botter Buell on the road for our kids in sixth grade and younger. Uh, the early bird registration deadline is today. If you register after today, that's fine, but you'll end up paying the full amount. So scan that QR code or head to our website or our app to learn more about those as well. Um, so this morning, uh, Pastor Jake is going to get us started in our uh, discipleship series. Super excited for that. And as we prepare ourselves for the service, I wanted to share this reminder from Psalm 42. Uh, the psalmist writes, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? And that's why we're here this morning, right? To meet with Jesus, because there's really no better place to be, but that is an invitation that's available to us every moment of every day and not just on a Sunday morning, to sit with him to be in his presence and to hear from him. So let's take these uh, next few quiet moments before the music starts to re reorient our hearts and our minds around that invitation, to lay down uh, what's been uh, demanding your attention this week, this morning, and maybe even right here in this moment. Um, they're gonna start playing here in a couple minutes, but uh, go ahead and take that time here in this next few minutes for some quiet.
from this posture of stillness, just begin to allow the Lord to draw you in. To be still and know that he is God. He is holy. He is righteous. He is filled with love and compassion and mercy. He is worthy. He is mighty. He is deserving of praise. And allow the still presence of the Lord to lead you into worship this morning.
as he speaks. Be with Jamie and Jake as they prepare messages for the next six weeks, Lord. And, uh, pray that you'll give them the words to preach and the words to write, Lord. And we're just so thankful for you and your love and your grace, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, can we praise the Lord this morning for his faithfulness? It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what's going on in the world, the Lord is a firm foundation, he's a rock and a hiding place for his people, and um, so grateful for that. Uh, it's interesting how the most chaotic times in our lives can expose our soul, isn't it? Uh, I remember sitting in the church office in March of 2020, and one of our staff members came in, and they said that the entire world was shutting down. They said schools are canceling, jobs were put on hold, local and national sports were postponed, extracurriculars were cut. It was a crazy and sad year on many levels. And as the world stopped and our frenetic lives were slowed to a halt, a peculiar thing happened that year. Uh, with our schedules and busyness stripped away, it was like someone pulled the cover off our spiritual lives. Uh, with that veneer of busyness gone, our souls were left exposed. And we found ourselves anxious, depressed, exhausted, burned out. The use of alcohol statistically spiked that year. Uh, we absorbed ourselves in social media, video games, Hulu, other forms of escape, anything that we could in order to avoid the way that we felt on the inside. Our souls were sick, and we knew it. And the worst part was we didn't know how to make sense of it all. It, it honestly was disorienting, especially for those that were followers of Jesus. During that year, I had conversation after conversation with Christians, and over and over, I would hear things like this. They would say, listen, when all of this is over, I'm never going back to how it was. See, uh, for many of us, we knew that the way that we were living wasn't working for us. We knew that our schedule and our lifestyle had caused the way that we felt on the inside. All of the goals and the dreams that we had pursued, all of the sports and activities that we had our kids in, even the Bible studies and the church activities and the church events, it hadn't given us more joy or more peace or more life in our soul. And so we knew that we didn't want to go back to the same thing. But here was the problem. We didn't know what to go to. We didn't know where to go after that. And so once the world reopened, for many of us, we went back to the same frenetic, overburdened life. Uh, sure, we may have trimmed a few things off, a few things there were, were put out of our schedule. But when the whirring hum of our busy lives quieted for a moment, we were left with the same nagging sense that our souls were hurting, uh, that we had no peace and little joy. Um, what we needed in that time was a compelling new way of living. We needed a new vision of life. And what if I told you that there is a practical way of living that could fill your soul with life? What if I told you that there was a pathway for you to experience abundance and goodness in every portion of your soul? And what if I told you that that pathway was right in front of you today for the taking? Would you take it? In John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. And in this, uh, this verse, the Greek word here for life is zoe. It means an absolute fullness of life, bursting at the seams with goodness, contentment, peace, joy. And this is exactly what we're searching for. And Jesus is promising this abundance of life, yes, for eternity, but not just in eternity. This word zoe actually means that that abundant life can start right now filling your soul today. So the question becomes, how can I experience the abundant life? How, how do I experience this overflowing way of living? Well, before we go forward, I think we have to go back. I think that's where we start. I think we have to first answer the question today, how did our souls even get there in the first place? I'm a Christian. I read my Bible. I pray a little bit. Like, why don't I have the abundant life? Why don't I feel flowing rivers coming out of my soul? How did I get here in the first place? And here's the reality. Your soul is not just formed when you're reading your Bible or when you are in church. I don't know if you knew that. As theologian, uh, theologian John Mark Comer says, he says, the formation of your soul is always happening. Whether you're a Christian or a Buddhist or an atheist or you're a single mom not sure what you believe about anything spiritual, we're all being spiritually formed by what we give our life to every single day. Your spiritual life is actually much like a tree. It's shaped by the place that you keep your roots every minute of every day of your life. 
In the Tenere wastelands of the Saharan Desert, there actually used to be a thriving forest of acacia trees. It's an amazing uh, story. But over the centuries, what happened is, as the climate changed, that once fertile land in northeastern Niger, it began to transform into a desert wasteland that we know today. And so one by one, the forest of trees began to die off until only a single solitary acacia tree remained called the Tree of Tenere. It became the only living plant in the lifeless desert. In fact, by the early 1900s, the tree of Tenere was the most isolated tree in the world, surrounded only by desert, 250 miles in every direction. To every observer, they asked the question about this unique tree, how? Like, how, how is this tree still alive in the middle of the life-taking environment of the Saharan desert? Was it a miracle? Was it an anomaly? Like, how did this happen? For decades, nobody knew until in 1938, locals dug a well near the tree, and as they got deeper into the sandy ground, what they found was uh, something unique. The tree of Tenere had somehow stretched its roots 100 feet down into the ground, somehow reaching the underground water table that was below the desert, where it was soaking up hydration and nutrients to live in the middle of the bone-dry desert. The tree of Tenere was just like every other tree, it was shaped and given life by where it put its roots. It simply found the right place to put those roots. And like a tree, your, your soul is actually shaped by the things that you repeat. Day in and day out, the places that you have planted your soul roots. There's no way around it. What you choose to look at on your phone, what activities you have your kids in, what you give your time to, how you go about your job, what you do right when you wake up in the morning what you do right before you go to bed at night, your schedule, your routine, your lifestyle, what you give your life to shapes you. So you ask, how did my soul get here? It was formed by the rhythms and the practices of your life. The, the fruit of your soul comes from the things that you give your time, energy, and affections to. Your way of living, your rhythms, your schedule, your priorities, they shape you for better or for worse. And if you want a better way of living, Jesus invites you into a completely new way. And this new way is actually an ancient way. And it's an ancient way that's filled with abundant life. So how do we follow Jesus's way of living? What does that look like? In Jesus's day, there were rabbis who would teach and these rabbis would, would have followers and these followers were called disciples. And so when Jesus would ask someone to be his disciple, he would use a simple phrase. He would tell them, follow me. And what he meant, in other words, was walk with me learn from me, actually live alongside of me and live like I do. The, the Greek word for disciple uh, is actually mathetes, and it's a word that describes a person who learns from a teacher, not just cognitively. Uh, a disciple is actually someone that learns their master's entire way of living. See, in our culture, we often think uh, of learning as merely information. Uh, we think of learning in a classroom setting uh, when I was in seventh grade, Jean Brown, who attends our church, she's sitting right back here. Miss Jean was my algebra teacher. Uh, and Jean is an expert at algebra. And so for that year uh, in her class, I sat there and I soaked in and learned everything I could about that topic. And I want to tell you, Miss Jean is a phenomenal teacher. And I, f I fell in love with math that year to the point that I actually went on and got uh, my undergrad minor was math. And while I'm sure I could have learned a whole lot more from Miss Jean about other areas of life beyond algebra, I was not her disciple. I was Miss Jean's student. See, a student learns information, but a disciple learns a way of living. John Mark Comer says, he says that disciples were actually less like students and more like apprentices. Apprentices follow a master around and learn his way of doing a trade. So when someone's beginning electrical work, what they do is they apprentice under a master electrician. They, they walk around with them, they spend time with them, and they don't start wiring houses on day one. Instead, the apprentice will follow them, watch their way of doing things in that trade. And at first, as they observe, they see how they do it. And then over time, the, the master slowly gives them small jobs where they can practice and they can begin to learn how it is done with their hands on. And over time, the apprentice then takes on much larger jobs until finally they can wire an entire building on their own. Apprenticeship is similar to the life of a disciple. 
Sinclair Ferguson writes this. He says, in antiquity and down to early modern times, being a disciple meant much more than being a pupil or a student in the academic sense. It also involved close contact with the master, not only listening to his teaching, but observing the implications of that teaching in his lifestyle, breathing in the atmosphere of his behavior patterns. The teacher was both master and model. Discipleship to Jesus is not just believing a set of truths. It is following a way of living. So when Jesus offers us this new way of living, it's not just an add-on to our everyday routine. When he calls us to this new way, to this path of abundant life, it completely changes our way of life. In the Gospels, the, the disciples reoriented or reordered their life around following Jesus in order to live the way he lived. Matthew left his tax collector business. Peter and Andrew left their, fi their fishing business. John did the same. And they learned the way that Jesus lived. They learned his daily rhythms. They learned his way of spiritual growth. They literally left everything and redirected their lives around walking with Jesus and following his way of doing things. And I'm not saying you have to, to leave today and send off a resignation letter for your job. You can, you can take a sigh of relief on that. Um, but the challenge for each of us is to live counterculturally, to release all hindrance, to release all busyness, all personal and cultural expectations. We must leave behind every voice, whether it be family expectations or inner expectations and pressures that tell us how to live our lives. These pressures and weights are keeping you from truly knowing and following Jesus. You have to release them and you have to follow him. See, Jesus calls us to completely reorient our life around him and his ways. Your eternal life comes through faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. That's the only way. But your abundant life comes as you learn to live every day walking with him, surrendering to him, giving every portion of your life to follow him. This is the way of Jesus. In Luke 14, Jesus says, we must count the cost of following him. And then he goes on to say, anyone who does not renounce all that he has cannot be to my disciple. Everything must be surrendered to him. Now, whenever this scripture is taught, at least when I've heard it, um, this idea that you must renounce all, what they talk about right off the bat is they say, uh, well, what this means is that you should die for Jesus, okay? And so um, to make a great sacrifice, missions, martyrdom, pain, and this is true. There's great cost and sacrifice in the Christian life. There's no way around that. In fact, Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, if anyone wants to follow me, be my disciple, what happens is, is they have to deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So followers of Jesus are called to great, great sacrifice. But I want us to see something. When we talk about these scriptures, we often skip over the progression of the discipleship life. The disciples in the gospels left everything, not with the intent of dying for Jesus, though many of them did give their lives for the Lord uh, over the course of their life. No, the first cost of following Jesus was actually leaving every earthly hindrance behind to simply be with him, to walk with him, to learn from him. So, so Jesus invites you to give up everything as you pursue this, this way of living, to give up your time, your commitments, your schedule, your family expectations. He invites you to reorient your life today around his way. And you may say, but well, well, what does that look like? I can't physically walk with Jesus today. Like I can't leave my job and become his disciple and follow him. How, how do I actually reorder my life around Jesus's life and his way of living? Um, six months ago, the elders, they tasked uh, three of our staff members, Stephanie McAllister, uh, Jamie Cotting, and I to explore that question. What does it look like to follow Jesus and be his disciple in the modern age? And so we dug into scripture, we prayed, uh, we read, we, we listened to podcasts, we had hours of conversation. And out of that work together, our, our church leadership believes that there are four core principles that are a pathway to reorienting your life around Jesus in his way. And, and the four are this, as followers of Jesus, we must learn to be with him. And then we must become like him or be transformed into his image. And then we must be with others, invest in others. And then we must be on mission. 
So this morning, I, I wanna walk us through these four values and let them be a guide for us as we look at how do we reconstruct our life around Jesus? What does it look like in the modern day to shift and reorient ourselves around him? Uh, but just like Jesus, I wanna warn you, this may be hard. There is, uh, challenge, there is challenge and sacrifice that you will be caused to walk into uh, there will be hindrances in your life that you will be challenged to give up as you truly pursue the Lord. So how do I reorient my life around Jesus? It begins here with our first value. You must first learn to be with him. In American culture, we're defined by what we accomplished, uh, by, by what we get done. We have hundreds of books on productivity, on time management, work efficiency. We celebrate work values of grit and grinding and capacity. And from our early life, we're actually trained to produce, to be doers. Even in the church world, we think, I have to be serving somewhere. I have to be working there, or doing this, because my value actually comes through my work or comes through what I do for God. But in the way of Jesus, this is actually not so. In the way of Jesus, a disciple's first activity is to be still before the Lord, to simply be with him, to be saturated by his presence. There's a story in Luke 10 uh, of two sisters, Mary and Martha. And Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, just being with him. Martha's rushing around the house preparing a meal. And, and Martha gets mad and she says, Jesus, tell Mary to do something. Tell Mary to work. And Jesus looks at Martha and says, Mary, what she is doing won't be taken away from her because she has chosen the better way. See, there's a better way of discipleship. It's first being with the Lord, sitting with him. Have you ever had someone say to you, well, don't just stand there, do something. Has anyone had, you had someone, I'm sure most of us have, right? Well, Henry Blackaby, he writes this. He says, I think God is saying the opposite. I think God is crying out to us saying, don't just do something, stand there. Enter into a love relationship with me. Get to know me, adjust your life to me. Let me love you and teach you about myself as I work through you. A time will come when action is required, but we must not short circuit the relationship. Your relationship with God must come first. And out of your walk with God, he accomplishes his plans for our world. We must learn to be alone with the Father before we do anything and allow him to reorient our lives around the things he tells us to do. In fact, this was the way that Jesus operated on earth. Throughout his ministry, he would get away with the Father in the quiet place just to be alone with him. Even when, when there were demands or when people needed something, he would get up early in the morning and he would spend time with the Father. I want you to see this in, in Mark 1. Jesus has just started his earthly ministry. He, he has, at this point, already gathered his disciples and he's healed large groups of people who are sick and demon-oppressed. And his ministry is gaining influence. It's spreading. And so you would think it would be time to double down, to sort of dig into his capacity and to put out a greater effort to build his ministry. But in Mark 1.35, it says this, rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. I mean, Jesus, he should be speaking at every Christian conference, right? And going to every synagogue. Uh, he should be getting his videos on YouTube and putting his website up and really starting to build his ministry. He has to get his name out there, be healing, teaching, doing the work of ministry. But instead, Jesus gets up early before everyone else not to get a jump start on the workday. He gets up early and sneaks off to the quiet place to spend time with the Father. See, this is where the, the process of being a disciple begins, being with him in the quiet place. Holland and I have two young kids, and so it's, it's rarely quiet in our house, and we're good with that because we love them a lot. Um, but the demands of our life are constant. So with Holland's job, uh, with ministry, with sports activities, family, we live a packed life. And it's just right now, it's, it's the season of life we're in. And so a number of years ago, I made a commitment. I decided on most mornings that I would get up before the kids were out of bed, and I would go down and just do something simple. I would sit on my couch, and I would listen to God. And so on most days, the alarm goes off at 5.30. I get out of bed. I go downstairs. I get a drink of water, and I I sit in the same corner of our couch almost every morning and I just sit there in the stillness of time and wait on the Lord. And I normally, I don't talk a lot at first. I just simply begin sitting there in silence and allow him to filter through my thoughts, allow him to filter through my heart uh, my feelings, and, uh, and then after a time, I may begin to say something to him or ask him a question, but then I'll just sit and wait and listen again. 
because I want to hear from the Lord. The reality is, is, is uh, there are times on those mornings where it seems like nothing happens, very little happens. And there's other times where his presence overwhelms me, but I do it because I can't live without him. I have to be with him. Because I need God above everything else in my life. And so a few years uh, of me getting up in the morning wasn't enough, and, and I started to need more. I was like, God, I need more of this, more of your presence, more of experiencing you. And so I love my times during the morning, but I would get into my day, and, you know, life comes at you, right? Things happen throughout the morning of the day. You've got things, uh, for me, it's ministry, things that I have to do. And I would get to noon, and it would feel like I had forgotten about God, like I just, you know, I'm moving through my to-do list and meetings and different things. And so a few years ago, I sensed God nudging me, and saying really something simple. He said, I want you to create space in the middle of your day where you cease to do things and you just simply pray and listen to me. And I, like, I remember fighting with God on this, arguing with him and saying, I've got like, God, you know my to-do, I got too much to do, right? Like there's too much in my life going on and you know like I gotta get things done so that I can get home and care for the family and like my life is packed. And I remember God just saying, just trust me. Will you just wait on me? and trust me with your time, and trust me with your to-do list, and trust me with your plans. And so for the last several years, I've tried to be intentional of stopping, even for short chunks in my day, and just putting aside the to-do list, even if it's huge for that day, and trusting God and saying, I'm gonna stop and meet with you. And I've found that as I've given him that time in his presence, he has actually progressively filled the other areas of my life with his presence. He's there in my times of activity and doing. He, he's there in my times of ministry. He's there in my times with my family. I, I found that he's actually filled every other moment of my life with his presence because I decided to put my time with him first. And if you wanna reorient your life around Jesus, what, what might you give up? What might you stop in your life or say no to in your life so that you can sit with him and be with him? Could it be Netflix late at night? Could it be giving up a half hour in the morning where you give up a little bit of sleep in order to sit with him? Could it be 15 minutes during your workday where you stop maybe during a lunch, a lunch hour and you take 15 minutes to sit and be and listen to the Lord and what he might wanna minister to you in? Could it be setting aside a full day or a half day of your life where you actually don't work, you don't do chores, you don't accomplish tax, tasks, but you actually just rest and stop and be in the presence of God? This is what the Bible calls a Sabbath day. See, when we truly follow Jesus, the reordering of our life actually becomes practical. It's very tangible. It becomes not just this add-on to our life, but it actually becomes a new lifestyle. Jesus changes what you do with your time. I don't know if you knew that. He changes your rhythms, your priorities, your practices. Comer says, if you wanna experience the life of Jesus, you have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. Over the course of centuries since Jesus was on earth, his followers have practiced ancient spiritual disciplines that have reset their rhythms in life around the way of Jesus, okay? So, um, and there's, there's a whole list of them. Some are internal, some are external, meaning ministering to others. The internal ones, there's a whole list, prayer, solitude, weekly Sabbath, stillness, silence, scripture study, fasting, and more. And see what the ancients knew, they knew that our souls are formed by the things we give our life to. And these practices were a way that they could be formed by Jesus instead of the pressures of the world and that they could experience his abundant life right now. And, and over the next year, as, as we roll out more about our discipleship pathway in different contexts, um, we're gonna begin to learn some of these ancient practices together to learn what it means like to implement them and to do them over a long period of time and, and to relearn what it looks like to be with the Lord and to spend time with him. We have to learn to be with him. This is the first of our core values of discipleship, but before we move forward into the other three, I, it's important to note, I, I want us to know as we move into these last three that these four values are not equal. They're equally important, but they're not equal in priority. We must prioritize being with Jesus, and I'll explain why. Because his presence is the root and the soil and the water table of the tree of your spiritual life. 
And out of that flowing water of his presence, he will bring the other three values to bear in your life. From his presence, he will sprout your transformation into his image. From his presence, he will fill your relationships. From his presence, he will fuel your mission, but it's all from his presence. So as we move forward, our second way of reorienting our life around Jesus is that we are transformed into his image. You may have noticed it's really hard to become like Jesus. Uh, I've been following him for 22 years, and I, I still look at my life and I think, why am I not more loving? Like I get, get mad at that person on the road, you know, that cuts me off, or I cut them off and I'm mad at them. Um, uh, why am I not more kind? Why am I so selfish? Why do I get angry so easily? Uh, in Luke 6, 40, Jesus, he tells us, he says that everyone who is fully trained will be like his master. And I wanna be like him. I wanna be like Jesus. But how does that happen? Like, why is it so hard? Uh, how, do I, how do I begin to be transformed into Jesus' image? Is it through self-suppression? Is it, is it through trying harder to be good? Is it through uh, guilting myself into that reality? Or, or maybe it's through more Bible study. Like, maybe if I learn more about the Bible, and I have more knowledge, I'll become more like Jesus through that process. And I wanna, I wanna say there is value in the study of scripture. But in John 15, Jesus says that spiritual life is like a vine. He says, I am the vine. Did you, did you catch that? He didn't say Bible study is the vine. He, he, didn't say, uh, he didn't say coming to church is the vine. Those are good practices. Those are important things that connect us to the Lord. But he didn't say that. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. In other words, spiritual transformation comes through connection. It comes through time with him. When we spend time with him, when we listen to him, when we submit to him and obey him, what happens is, is then we are changed from the inside out to bear fruit in life. Listen to me, it's not just information. I want you to hear this, because we've, in America, we'll talk more about this, but in America, we've worked off an information-based growth system for church for a long time, but information does not lead to transformation on its own. It doesn't. It's encounter that changes us. It's when we see Jesus face to face, as we meet with him, we are changed from the inside out. The information of scripture, the information of theological study can fuel that, but it's, it's ignited by the fire of Christ's presence. It fuels us and changes us. The third way we reorient our life around Jesus is we learn to be with others and invest in them. A few years ago, our staff went to a ministry conference in Georgia, and it was this huge conference, thousands of ministry leaders in attendance. We were in this big arena. And uh, one, of the, one of the days, this pastor from California, he gave this amazing talk that actually brought everyone to their feet in the standing ovation. It was this, this God moment at the conference. But that's not what blew me away about the leader. Uh, right after that session, we went on a lunch break, and they had food trucks out in uh, the parking lot. And so we went out there and grabbed some food, and Len, Sean, and I sat down on a curb to start to eat our, our greasy food. And uh, as we sat down, I looked across the parking lot, and on the other corner, there was this pastor. And there were a group of 20-somethings sort of gathered around him eating. And uh, so this pastor was sitting in the grass with his group of disciples, and it didn't matter that they were young. It didn't matter that they may be broken. Uh, he, he, honestly, he could have been sitting in the glory of the green room. He could have been, like, there eating high-end food and, and, and uh hobnobbing with all of the other Christian celebrities at the conference, but instead he was sitting in the grass eating french fries out of a brown paper bag and laughing with 25 young adults because he just wanted to be with his people. And in that moment, I saw a picture of Jesus who had all of the glory in heaven. And uh, he could have spent time with any other person, and yet he wants to spend time with me. He wants to spend time with broken little me. And because he wants to spend time with me in the quiet place and pour into me in that space, it makes me want to pour into somebody else. It makes me want to take what he's given me and pass it on to somebody else. So who are you investing in? 
Who are you pouring into in your life? You might say, well, I don't, I don't have time. Like, I work long hours. I've got a lot on my plate. Like, I, you know, I don't have time for that. That's a pastor's job to invest in other people. No, this is the way of Jesus. And if we're serious about following him, we will reorder our life to do the work of discipling others. See, modern society, we've rejected this idea of mentor, mentoring and discipleship. Uh, and really, we've rejected it because it seems like a waste of time, doesn't it? I mean, if we're honest, uh, at work, the apprentice just slows down the job. The intern doesn't add a whole lot. And as we're trying to teach them and train them, they actually make the job harder. That's often how it goes. But in God's kingdom, we are called to pull others who are downstream who aren't as far along as us, we're called to pull them up by giving away what we've received from the Lord, even if that means that we travel slower, and you probably will. As Jesus changes us, we must pass on his words, his teaching, and his very presence to others. Being with Jesus makes me want to pass that on because he's given me something worth passing on. So who are you investing in and who is investing in you? This is the way, the third way that we reorient our lives around him. The fourth way we reorient our life around Jesus' way is that we go on mission with him. And as humans, we love this part. This is the part that we love, right? So we get to do something. We, we get to accomplish the goal, take the hill, meet the need. But this is only a partial biblical view. And I, we'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. Um, but I do just want to guide us through this. This is a partial biblical view because too often we rush into the mission. We see a need and we volunteer. We we get excited about a cause and we jump into things. But in John 15, which I read a few minutes ago, Jesus said this. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches, and whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. And then he finishes with this amazing phrase. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus, I can do like a little bit, I feel like, right? Like I can do like, like I can offer a little bit to the kingdom. No, he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Many of us make disciple a verb. We think, well, well, I have to be doing something. I have to accomplish something. I have to produce for God. But this actually leads to burnout and exhaustion. And some of us have experienced that. And the reason it leads us to that place is because we're not operating in God's unique will and grace for our life. He gives you grace to accomplish the assignment he gives you. Uh, Hold on a second. Like, so you're going to tell me like, that just feels wrong. It feels so inward focused that I'm going to spend time with the Lord. Like, does it, does it mean that I, I don't do anything? Like, we're supposed to build the kingdom. We're supposed to preach the gospel. We're supposed to go to all the world and take the gospel and make disciples of all nations. How are you going to say that? Well, yeah, we are supposed to do each of those things. Jesus commands his disciples to do many things, but our activity for Christ must come from our intimacy with Christ. We do many things for Jesus, but are we doing them without an intimate connection with him? If so, it's like flailing around in a swimming pool. If I flail around in a swimming pool trying to swim, but I'm actually just staying in one place, what happens is you splash around, you don't go anywhere, and in the frenetic movement, you wear yourself out to the point that ultimately you you sink. And I'm gonna say something bold. I think scripture would teach from John 15 that we should not do any ministry or anything in life for that matter, unless it has been given to us from the Father. Hold on a second. How how are you going to say that? Like, How are you going to say that we shouldn't do anything without the Father giving it to us? Because Jesus says, apart from me, without connection to me, you accomplish nothing. In fact, this is the way that Jesus lived. If you read the Gospel of John, it's all through it. In John 12, Jesus is speaking of his earthly ministry. He says this, I've not spoken on my own authority, but what the Father who sent me has himself given me a new commandment, what to say and what to speak. And then over and over, Jesus would say things like this. He would say, I only do what my Father has commanded me to do, only what he has given me or told me to do. See, you are called to be on mission with God, but your mission comes from your time with the Father. And as you are with him, what happens is is he will give you 
When you're with the Father, there's no way around it. These happen simultaneously. He will give you a Holy Spirit kingdom assignment that he is already working in, that he's sending you into. When we try to do it on our own, we enter into what we want to do. We, we, we have our mission, our goal, our thing, but the Father's already working everywhere around you. And you have to be with him and hear from him and learn where he's working and learn where he's sending you. See, everything in our life, in our, in our spiritual life, our transformation, our relationships, our mission has to be done from an intimacy with him. Discipleship is actually learning to live every moment, whether you're at work or whether you're at home or wherever you are, it's learning every moment, learning to live every moment of your life in Jesus's presence and then to follow his ways. This is the life of a follower of Jesus because this was the life of Jesus. Henry Nouwen wrote this. He said, Jesus's life moved along a continuum from solitude or time with the Father to community and then to ministry, and a continuum begins again. Be with the Father. Spend time with him. Move into community. Invest in your community, and then move into ministry as he leads you. It's simultaneous. It's happening all the time, but it begins in the quiet place. Jesus would spend time with the Father. Then with the presence of the Father, he would go out among the people. And then with the power of the Father, he would carry out his assignment. And then he would go back to the quiet place and meet with the Father again and start it over. This is the life of discipleship, to learn to live every moment, whether you're in the quiet place or you're with people or you're working on a God-given assignment, to live every moment in his presence. And as we move into the next season of life at Freshwater, this is our discipleship fr framework. It's to be with him and to allow that to fuel becoming like him, being with people, investing in them, and being on mission. And over the course of several years, uh, we're going to begin to reorder the discipleship end of our church around some of this reality. We're going to learn to be with Jesus and allow it to fuel every bit of those things. And it's going to shape everything we do and don't do as a church. It, it will be the way that we are formed as a people in the discipleship wing. See, Jesus calls us to completely reorient our lives around him and his way of living. And so what do we do? As we close, what do we do with all this? This call to reorder our lives can feel a bit impossible, can it? Um, how do I find time to be with him? I mean, I have a job, family responsibilities. How do I disciple someone else? Uh, I don't even have time for my closest friends. How am I going to make time for that? Where do I make time to take on a Holy Spirit given assignment? I, my schedule is packed out. It feels incredibly difficult. It feels like there's hurdles to reordering our life. And for many of us, if we're honest, we feel trapped by the busyness of our lives. And if I were to sit down with you and you described your schedule this morning, you'd probably say something like this. You'd say, I mean, you, just listen to my day. It's packed. I wake up at 5 a.m., get the kids ready for school. I rush off to the office for a 10-hour day at work. Then I come home, I take timid piano lessons, and then, I, and then I take Susie off to soccer practice, then I rush back across town, I get Timmy back to, to football practice. Then we eat dinner at nine, and at, and at nine o'clock we get the kids to bed and we, we clean a few things up, we crash into bed, and then we do it all over again the next day. And, or maybe you don't have kids, but your life's filled with all of these other priorities, all of these other things and needs and demands. And then the church only piles on top of that. I think we have to be honest about that. So you come into church and, and on Sunday morning, you're already tired, you're overextended, you're burned out, and then you hear, well, you should join a community group so that you can spend time with other people and, and invest in relationships. And you should, you should also find a place to serve so that you can care for other people here at the church. And, and when's the last time you evangelized? Like, you should be telling people about Jesus. And all we come across, that we, we feel guilty, right? We come out of that feeling guilty. And all of those are biblical. All of those are good. And yet in the rat race of our lives, they feel like one more thing to do. And so we sit on this spiral of guilt. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time. How do I make this happen? I, I know I should be doing that, God, but I don't even know where to fit it in. I feel like that's a great question. How do I fit one more thing into my life? But a better question is, if I am being spiritually formed every moment of my life, the better question is, what is busyness doing to my soul? Theologian Thomas Merton says that hurry and busyness is a pervasive form of contemporary violence on the soul. He writes this, to allow oneself to be carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns, to surrender to too many demands, to commit oneself to too many projects, to want to help everyone and everything is to succumb to violence. Busyness is destructive to your soul. 
The more I live, the more I'm convinced that one of the greatest hindrances to our spiritual life in the modern age is busyness and hurry. Several years ago, Pastor John Ortberg called his mentor, Dallas Willard, on the phone. Ortberg was weary, and so he asked Willard, he said, uh, Dallas, what does it look like to be spiritually healthy in this day and age? And Willard paused on the phone for an extended period of time thinking, and then, and then he said this. He said, John, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. And so Ortberg jotted this down, and, uh, and then he said, that's very good. What else can I do? And Willard paused again for a time, and then he prophetically said this. He said, John, there is nothing else. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry. What you give your life to forms you. And if you give your life to frenetic living and hurry, it will form you for the worse. But if you live counterculturally, if you slow down, if you learn to be with Jesus in the quiet place, if you remove hindrances, burdens, in order to first be with him, he will form you and his presence will fill you with the abundant life that you're looking for. And he will give you amazing Holy Spirit assignments that you never could have dreamed of. And so how do we begin to reorient our lives around Jesus? I think the first step for many of us is surrendering again. Surrendering our time, our schedules, our priorities, our motivations to Jesus again. In Mark 8, Jesus says, what, what do you benefit? What is the profit of your life? If you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul, is anything worth more than your soul? In this passage, Jesus is using a, uh, he's using a financial term, it's to profit. In, in the Greek, it's ophelio. It's something that brings a payoff. In other words, Jesus is saying, what's, what's gonna be the payout of your life? What will your way of living bring you in the end? What will it profit you if your kids get into the right college, but uh, in the process, they forfeit their relationship with the Lord? What will it profit you if you have all of the success you want in your career, if in the process you ignore Christ? What, what, what will it profit you if you get a bigger house or you, you, a better life or you get everything you ever wanted if along the way you reject your abundant life with the Father? What is the profit of what you give your life to? And if you're a follower of Jesus already, it's uh, a moment of surrender. It's time to begin to clear out the busyness and the clutter and the demands that he hasn't called you to, to simply be with him. It's interesting, I was talking to Holland last night as we um, were uh, finishing dinner and, and doing dishes, and I said, it's fascinating as we've been working through some of the stuff and as I've been preparing for today, it's been probably one of the busyness, busiest last month and a half for our family and for ministry that I've experienced in my life. And um, I was sitting there processing that last night before I went to bed, and thinking through, well, what do, you, what do you do with that? Because different seasons are busier than others. And the Lord, I felt like, spoke. It's simply being with me. There's, a, there's a, uh, an illustration uh, where someone has a jar and they have big rocks and small rocks and sand all around the jar, and they say, I wanna put all of these contents into the jar. And if someone starts with the pebbles and the sand, they don't have the space for the big rocks. You guys have probably seen this done. But if the person puts the big rocks in first, the other things fit around it. The sand can, can get into the, the, into the capacity of the, the cylinder and fit around the large rocks. And I felt like God was saying the simple place is surrender. It's not that we don't want to be with Jesus. It's that we feel like we're pulled in a million different directions. And so what do we do to even change that? I think it's first just being with him and allowing him to filter out like a colander, filter out everything in our life that doesn't need to fit. We can't just add one more thing onto our life and expect it to fit into the massive busyness of our life. It starts by surrendering and saying, God, everything is open-handed here. I'm not gonna do anything in my life that you don't want, but the start of that is I'm gonna sit and be with you.
And so as we uh, finish out this morning, we're gonna create a space that you can process with the Lord. We're gonna sing a song, and it's really a time of prayer or response to the Lord. Um, and, and much of this has been for those that are already following Jesus, but there is a promise for you. If you, if you are wrestling with faith and you're like, I, I wanna follow Jesus, I wanna experience that abundant life, he offers that to you this morning. And this can be a time where you decide, I'm not gonna go my own way anymore. I'm going to obey you and follow you. And his offer to you of eternal life comes through his finished work on the cross. It comes through his death on the cross for our sins. And this could be a time that maybe you offer your life to him and receive his forgiveness for the first time. So I'm gonna lead us in prayer here and then we're gonna lead into a time of worship. And I wanna encourage you, if the Lord is working on your heart, this is a day where you can resurrender again, where you can respond to him. Lord, you know what you wanna do in our hearts and in our lives. And I'm confident as I look at my life and I, and I spend time with my friends, that you have a way of living and a way of abundant life that is so much greater than we've ever tasted. And Lord, if we would take the step and trust you, there's something good ahead. And so would you fill this place with faith this morning? Lord, I, pr I just pray against um, any thought of doubt, um, or even objection. I pray against any stronghold or barrier that would say, I, how is this even possible? Where do I even start? I've tried this before. Lord, I think those are honest questions, but I pray that you'd replace them with, with faith. I pray that you'd uh, replace that with courage, Lord, to take a step today that would change everything ahead. We thank you for your invitation into the abundant life. We thank you, Lord, that you set a model for how we can walk with you. And Lord, we surrender to you together. In Jesus' name, amen.
going to leave just a 30 seconds here to communicate with the Lord, and then I'm going to pray us out of it and, and send us on. But maybe there's something the Lord is still pressing on you, and you're holding back from him, and this is an opportunity to say, today is the day that I walk into your life, Lord. One more time. Here is where. Here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Lord, I pray a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Every time there is surrender, Lord, you just pour your presence into it. So I just pray, Lord. Fill the place of surrender with your, your spirit right now. We thank you for the promise that it's your Holy Spirit that will teach us your ways, that will teach us about you. We thank you for your promise that the Holy Spirit goes with us, and I pray, Lord, that you would just bring more awareness of your presence, more awareness of your spirit's leading in our lives. And Lord, I just want to pray boldly, will you do something new in our church community? Any good thing is born from you, Lord. Any good thing for our families, any place of, of new way of living is born from you. And so, Lord, would you do something new in our church? We do surrender to you, Lord, in your ways. Fill us with truth. Fill us with life. Fill us with your love, your goodness. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it was good to be together this morning. Uh, thanks for being here to worship with us. And... Uh, uh, yeah, just, we love you guys, um, and we're available. Our prayer team will be down front. We'd love to talk or pray with anyone. I'll be around as well. We'd love to talk or pray with anyone. Um, as you go today, there are giving boxes in the back if you want to uh, bring an offering as an act of worship that's there if you want to drop it in there. And uh, we hope that you have a great week. We love you. See ya.